And Professor Rees, please proceed with your testimony. Mr. Woha, thank you to the chairman and members of the committee for inviting me here to testify today. My name is Elizabeth Reese Yompovi, and I am from Nambe Pueblo. I hold degrees in political science and political theory from Yale and from the University of Cambridge, and a law degree from Harvard. I am now a law professor at Stanford, where I teach and write about tribal law, federal Indian law, constitutional law, and civil rights law. But I was asked to testify here today, not only because of my academic expertise, but because of my professional experience. Before becoming an academic, I was an attorney at the National Congress of American Indians, where I worked closely with the first tribes who were implementing expanded criminal jurisdiction under VAWA 2013. I talked on a regular basis with the tribal prosecutors, judges, and defense counsel. I explained the intricacies of this law, its requirements, its limitations, more times than I can count. I tracked data from the implementing tribes and listened firsthand to the harrowing stories about what it was like to be on the front lines of those prosecutions. And then I took all of that and I wrote it up into the five-year report published in 2018 that's been cited so many times today already. In my written testimony, I discuss at length many of the key takeaways from that report, including the need to increase VAWA's funding as well as its scope to other crimes against women. But in my remarks today, however, I'll focus on why it makes particular sense to expand VAWA to adjacent criminal conduct and respond to some concerns about the constitutional rights of non-Indians in tribal courts. To begin, currently, tribes cannot charge defendants with any of the crimes that happen alongside the domestic violent event that they are actually prosecuting, such as violence against children, drug possession, assault on law enforcement, or just a simple DUI that happens while fleeing the scene. Expansion to adjacent crimes would create a more equitable system for prosecutors and defense counsel to navigate. And that is because the vast majority of criminal cases in the United States are resolved not at trial, but by plea bargaining. And one of the most common tools that prosecutors and defense counsel have when negotiating a plea is that there are often multiple charges of criminal conduct. Taking a serious or minor offense off the table allows the two sides to arrive at a result that they can both live with. Without the full power to charge an offender with all of the crimes that they are suspected of committing, both sides are stuck with just that one offense, domestic violence. A charge which is notoriously difficult to prosecute in court because it relies on the cooperation of often highly traumatized and reticent witnesses. Violent crime is messy. And granting tribes the power to prosecute just one kind of crime simply doesn't reflect the reality of how crime happens or the tools that people in the criminal justice system need to do their jobs. Now, despite the truly unacceptable levels of violence against Native women, change has been slow, in part due to concern about the rights of non-Indians in tribal courts. And to that, I have two responses. The first is to clarify the law on this matter since these concerns are rooted in several fundamental misunderstandings of the law. To begin, although the constitution itself does not apply to tribal governments, the Indian Civil Rights Act, particularly as amended by the Tribal Law and Order Act and VAWA 2013, extends all of the relevant constitutional protections in a criminal court proceeding to non-Indian defendants. Congress created these protections and provided the powerful remedy of habeas corpus. As such, non-Indian defendants in tribal court already enjoy the same protection from unlawful detentions as they would in any other American court. Which leads me to my second response to those who may be worried about the fairness or adequacy of the justice system that tribes are running. And that is a simple reminder that tribal governments are American governments too, and that as such, they are no less worthy of our trust, respect, and dignity. Like any other American, like any other government in this country, tribes are just a group of your fellow American citizens simply trying their best to do what is best for the people that they are responsible for. They are not perfect, but we ought to shy away from the continued unbefitting distrust of tribal governments as somehow inherently more suspect or less capable of, defensing equal, of dispensing equal justice. They, just like you, are trying in good faith to make and enforce laws that help people thrive and protect them from harm. And it is high time that we trusted them to do that. I look forward to questions from the committee. Thank you very much, Professor Reese. Uh, 